we'll talk a bit about reinforcement learning today. So if we first take one step back and look at machine learning uh, as a whole, like what is machine learning? So machine learning pretty much consists of different methods to learn through experience. So you have groups within machine learning. Uh, you have uh, supervised learning, which is where you have uh, data, input data, and output data already ready for the model to train on. Uh, a good example here is, for instance, uh, image classification. So you have already, you're telling the model that these images are this, and you try to get the model to learn how to predict that. Uh, then we have unsupervised learning. That is just what it sounds like. Uh, you have not given the model any input more than just the raw data. Uh, and you're trying to get it to do something for you. A uh, common thing here is uh, clustering, to find groups of data that, that is belonging together. Uh, then we have uh, reinforcement learning, uh, which is what we're going to talk about now. Uh, it basically consists of uh, the model being told that is doing something good or something bad and then trying to learn from that. Uh, feature learning is more of a higher level thing uh, where you're trying to get a model to learn how to present features to a second model. So like how to represent a feature space in a good way. Uh, and then you have anomaly detection. Um, basically the normal example there is uh, fraud for a credit card fraud, for instance. So what you're trying to do is to construct some kind of model and then optimize parameters of that model to get it to do the tasks that we want it to do. Uh, there are lots of different ways to construct a model. Uh, here's a few examples with neural networks. Uh, you can have support vector machines, uh, more basic like regression analysis, um, and also something quite different with genetic al algorithms. Uh, we're going to play a little bit with artificial neural networks uh, today, but that's more later on. But to see what a neural network is, uh, this is an example of a very basic neural network. Uh, we have an input layer where our features come in, uh, and then we have one or more hidden layers. Um, and then, of course, we need some kind of output. So between all of these, this is what you call a, a fully connected or a dense layer. So each node in the layer top here is connected to each node in the hidden layer. Uh, what you do here is that you have a weight, which is basically a multiplication of the data coming through this node before it reaches this one. So this is one of the things that you or the main thing that you modify in this model to try to get the output the way you want it. Uh, there are, of course, multiple different ways, things you can change in this type of network. You can have different number of layers, you can have different number of nodes. Uh, here you usually have some kind of activation function. So what you do with the data, the, the, um, the data you get into the node before you send it further on. Uh, sigmoid functions, tan functions, there's a lot of different choices there. And there is, of course, a lot of different options as well uh, when it comes to types of layers. So this is a Z, it's a dense layer, um, often used together with dropout, or dropout is used for most of these. Dropout is basically that you are randomly zeroing out a certain path within the network. Uh, then you have other ones that are more of uh, used for time series, like GRU, LSTM, long short term memory, or recurrent networks, uh, or recurrent layers. And then you have convolutional and pooling that are very often combined to do things like image processing or image recognition. So back to reinforcement learning. So a lot of these are tried to, quite, quite often you try to explain this as a mark of decision process. So your model of the environment is that you have a state, you perform an action, which leads to a new state and then a reward. And that is what you're trying to make your model learn, how to maximize the reward, how to pick an action that maximizes the reward. And, and to do that, the model or your algorithm has to try to explore, because you don't tell it where, how to get the reward. It needs to randomly find the way to do that. 
So we're going to look at a, a simple example of reinforcement learning. Uh, so it's called Q-learning, that stands for quality learning. Uh, so what you do is that you have a table that fits all of your states and all of your available actions. And you're trying to store how good each action is to take in a certain state. So what you do is then you iteratively try different actions from different states and then you update your table depending if the, you want to be in the next state or not. So how well it went when you took that action. So to test this out, we're going to use an environment uh, done by OpenAI. Uh, it's, they say that it's a gym as a toolkit for developing and comparing reinforcement learning algorithms. So uh, I can just quickly skip over to the, their page here. Uh, and you see that basically it gives you a simple environment uh, where you have many different games or many different tasks that your model should try to perform uh, and you get an easy way to interact with that. So it takes away all of the setup that you need to do and you can focus on the, the learning or the modeling part. So uh, to use it, the starting point, you import the Python package and then you create your environment. So if we start there, jumping over to uh, Spider here, and we run this, where we basically import the package, we create what's called the, the frozen lake, and we render the first frame of that. So that one renders as text, and we can see the first rendering in the console here. Uh, afterwards, we can see the observation space and then action space. So we can see that there are 16 different states that we can end up in. Uh, and then there is uh, four different actions that we can take. So if we look at our, our first output here, we are in the S that marks the start position. And then we're trying to get to the G. But we can only walk on the F square, which is the frozen parts of the lake. So each H represents a hole, and if we try to step there, we will fall down and we will lose that, that game. Um, and the actions that we have is move left, down, up and right. Uh, to make it a little bit more complicated, if we tell it to move down, it might actually not move down. Uh, there's a bit of randomness, so sometimes you move in the direction that you want, sometimes the ice is too slippery, so you're going somewhere else. So then, if how do we decide in Q-learning what we want to do? How do we explore and how do we ask our model what to do? So there are two ways to deal with exploring, or there are more ways, but there are two very common ways. Uh, it's epsilon greedy, which is where you give it an epsilon or a, a, a point that basically tells how often you want to perform a random action. And otherwise, if you above that point, you use the output from the model. If you're below that point, you randomly pick the action that you're going to take. Uh, another approach is the Boltzmann. So here they're trying to use the output from the model. Uh, because the thinking is that the model will know that some are really bad from the quite early on and we want to take those less often but we still want to take the ones that might be might be interesting. Uh, so this one looks at the output for different actions. What we're getting there is, is generally a number. Uh, we can scale that so the sum of those becomes one using a softmax and then we can use those as weight to probabilistically take a, um, an action. So we're taking a random action, but each of the probabilities for each action is based on the output of the model. So how does that look if we do that in Python code? Uh, we start by just importing TensorFlow and NumPy. TensorFlow that we're going to use, it's a library for doing different types of machine learning. Uh, and NumPy is a general uh, numerics library in Python. So 
First, we have the greedy epsilon strategy, where you give it the, the table, the quality table, you have uh, the current state, the environment, and your epsilon. So you're taking a random number and see if it's below epsilon, then we just take a random sample from the uh, action space. If it's above, we look at our Q table, we see for this state, we have these actions and we pick the one that is greatest, the highest. So it's a little bit similar in the Boltzmann, but we're still then taking a random um, pick from the action space uh, with the different probabilities of the output from the Q table softmax. So we're scaling those so we can use them as decent probabilities and then we're letting NumPy pick one according to those weights. So we run that so we can use those. And then, how? What, what do we actually want to do? So, look a little bit closer to what is happening in our environment. We first need to initialize our table. So we're creating a table full with zeros, because we don't know anything about the actions, so we want a neutral. And then we create it of the size of the observation space and the action space. So in this, this instance, it's 16 times four. Uh, so let's create that and then we can actually try to play with that one. Uh, what we do is that we reset the environment, we get a state and then while we're not done, we render the environment, we sleep for a little while so we can see the renderings and then we're getting an action out. We're using the function we had before with the epsilon of q which means that we're always picking what the model wants and never picking a random action. And then we're using that to step forward in the environment. And we're doing that over and over again until we're done. And then we just render the last state. And if you see what happened here, we're trying to walk left the whole time because we don't have any information about actions. And you can see it goes up and down a little bit because it was slippery ice. And we ended up in the bottom hole and we lost. No surprise there, since we have basically not, since we haven't trained anything yet at all. So before we try to teach our model anything, I will just show you this. So uh, we have logging here. So this is TensorBoard. Uh, basically gives you a way to look at your training of your models to see what is happening while you're training or and also try to determine what happened after you've been training. Maybe you want to compare different, different types of models um, or different approaches. So it comes with TensorFlow uh, uh, but just does visualization. So if we start by setting that up, we, what we do is that we point to a log directory so um, frozen lake and then we append uh, the current time to make that unique and we create a file writer for that using TensorFlow and we tell them that that should be the default one so if we're trying to log anything it should be done using this file writer. So that's all we need to do first to set that up and then how do we then update this? Like we have a table right now it's full of zeros how do we know what to put in the table? So what we do is that we have in, we want to update our queue with the current state for a specific action that we're taking this time point. We take the current value that that has and then we add on um, a bigger part here where we start out by taking the best action for the next state. So we looked at, okay, now we're in state T, we perform action A T, and we end up in S T plus, plus one. And we take the maximum, so the highest quality action for the new state, multiply that uh, with uh, gamma here, uh, and because we want that, that our old state, the action for in the old state led us to this but we want to discount that. 
is also called a discount factor. So we want to slowly the reward we gotten for B, this action here should become less and less and less the further away from it we get. Uh, and then we also have the reward that we got for taking the, this action that we just took. And then we subtract the, the current value uh, so this doesn't grow, uh, just blow up the table. And then we have a learning rate here, alpha. So the learning rate is basically how big of an update we want to do. Uh, how big a step, because we might not be certain that we're taking the step in the right direction. So you, you don't want a too big learning rate, but at the same time you want to learn as fast as possible. So this is a, both of these are parameters that you tend to want to play around with a little bit to see what gives the optimal result. And if we then try to use this and see if we actually can, can train our model that we have. So, um, to visualize a little bit better how we're going, we have an evaluate function. Um, there we want to loop over 50 times and play the game, and then we uh, collect all the rewards that we got, all the scores. Uh, so, for each time, we reset the environment. While we are not done with this game yet, we get an action. Again here we have epsilon zero, so we only rely on the model. We don't want any randomness here. We want to see how well the, the model is doing. Uh, and then we use that to step the next one, update the state, uh, collect the reward, and then uh, we have uh, checking if we're done or not. And then in the end, here, uh, when we're done with the game, we look at the reward that we got and we append that. Uh, the way you get rewards in this game is that you get zero reward until you end up in the goal. If you end up there, you get one. Which means that the best result we can get in reward after a complete game is one. We're either going to get one or zero, so we want this to average to as close to one as possible. And then we have the factors that we talked about for the updates. We have the gamma. Um, sorry, just get rid of the... Uh, we have the discount factor, which is the, the gamma that we talked about, and then we have the learning rate, the EPS DK, so the epsilon, how quickly we want to decay that. Because you generally want to start out exploring a lot, because your model doesn't know anything. But if you only do random actions all the time, you're probably not going to go very far, especially if the, if the game is a bit harder to manage. Um, so you probably want to rely more and more on your model, but you want to keep all the time a slight randomness because even when you've gotten far in the game, you still want to take some random actions to find new paths that might be better or try to figure out what you did wrong last time. Uh, but we start out with Epsilon being one, and then we just have a little loop counter to see what game we're on. And then we just go through here and play the game and try to update. So it, this looks very similar to when we're just playing the game. We reset the, en the environment, we, until we're done with the game, we get the action, but you see here we're now we're sending our epsilon, that then is gonna shrink over time. Uh, and we step, and we now save, so we have the state and we have the new state. And then we need to update the queue table. So this is exactly what we had before in the slide. So you want to uh, update the state and the action that we took. So the specific point in the table that represent the state and this action. And you take the current value plus the learning rate times reward plus the gamma, so the discount factor, and the best action in the new state minus the current uh, value for the state and the action. So this is exactly the update that we had in the slide. And you just assign that, and then you uh, move the new state into state, and you start over again. And do this over and over again, uh, and every time you finish a game, we shrink Epsilon a little bit and try to rely a little bit more on the model and hoping that it learns a little bit. And then in the end here, we have that every hundredth game, uh, we log stuff to TensorBoard. So this is the second step of the thing that we did with TensorBoard before. We're saying, okay, I want to summarize, I have a, scal uh, a scalar that, uh, called Eps, and we just log Epsilon to that, and we have the step 
for that. So you're going to see that later in the graph. And the score as well. So in here we're using our evaluate function to calculate the score of how well our model is doing right now. So let's run this. And then we go over to TensorBoard. And you can see that our epsilon is slowly going down. And hopefully, we will soon get a little score here as well. Let's do a reload. While it does that, we can have a look actually uh, at our queue table. So we break the training. And if we look here at Q, you can see that it has now started to update the values. Uh, I'm not sure why it didn't update the score. Maybe it'll come in a bit. Um, so you can see each of these rows represents one state. And then we have the four different actions. So if we scroll up, so we can see how the, the game board looked like, so to say, we can see that uh, if we for instance, take the second row here, which is the second F. So we have, we're here, just above a hole. If we look at what it's trying to do then, is we can see that the one that is the highest is the fourth action, which is then move up. So it's trying to go away from the hole. And you can see that the lowest one is the one to go down. It's not zero which it might maybe should, but sometimes going down might still work because you're not always moving in the direction that you're trying to move. But you're seeing the best one here is trying to go up. Otherwise, going left and right is not that bad, but going down is the least, uh, the, the worst option. Um, let's just do a reload here. There we go. And we can see here our, our score then as well. Uh, so quite quickly, we started to actually get a score. We actually started to, to manage to get there sometimes. And we see that it's stabilizing here, goes up and down, uh, but it fluctuates around a little bit below 0 0.75. Uh, and I think that we can't get that much higher because there's always going to be some randomness and sometimes no matter what we do, we're going to fall into a hole. Uh, so let's see how well we actually are doing. So we going to play it, and uh, we can see now on the right side, we're choosing to go left, and up, and we move around a little bit, you can see the randomness in the movements, but so far we have tried, we have managed to stay away from the holes, and they were actually got to the goal as well. So we got a score. So good, good round. So here we have managed to learn a quite basic game. Um, however, this algorithm becomes kind of cumbersome if you increase the complexity of the problem. Uh, right now we have 16 states, we have four actions, not really a problem. Uh, but if you look at something bigger, so a self-driving car, uh, you're going to have maybe if you make it easy, you have just a video in. But then you usually maybe you have a LiDAR, maybe you have a, a, some radars, and you have ultrasound, you have a lot of things. And all of those can have a lot of different values, and, and the combination of all of those is then each combina possible combination is then a possible state. So it blows up, it's impossible to represent in memory, this kind of table, so we need something else. So one option for this something else is DQNs, or deep Q networks. So what you then try to do is to create a multi-layered artificial neural network that mimics the Q table. So we're still trying to use the whole approach with a quality table for our actions, but instead of actually having a table, we're trying to build a model that estimates that table. Uh, but that also means that we're going to train it in a similar way to what we did in Q learning, but we're going to use a slightly different environment. We're going to use a mounting car. And first, we have a look at that environment. So we see what we get ourselves into. Let's take that away. 
Uh, start out importing a few libraries, same ones as before. Uh, we have TensorFlow. You can see we're using TensorFlow <coughs> Keras here. Uh, TensorFlow Keras is a more high level API towards TensorFlow. Uh, you're going to see it used for own. It's an easy way to construct models uh, and also to train them. You can use Keras with other things than TensorFlow as well, but Keras is actually part of the TensorFlow API as well. Uh, so then we set up the environment. You can see we're using the mounting car instead. And then we have a very similar get action. It's the epsilon greedy one again, um, where we have our epsilon and we take a random action from the action space, or we're taking the state and asking our model to predict that. So remember that before we had a table that we looked up the action qualities. Now we're trying to have our model represent what qualities the action should be, which means that when we do a prediction, we're asking it what are the quality values for this state, for the actions in this state. And then we're taking the best one of those. So we're doing the same thing as we did with the table, just using the model instead of the table. And then we're building a model. Um, I'm definitely not saying that this is the best model you should use in this one, but it's a simple one, so that's the one we're going to use. Uh, we're creating a sequential module, you see here, then we have Keras, which means that all the layers that we add are connected to the next one. So it is just one layer after another. Uh, and we start out by using a, a dense one uh, with 64 nodes and an activation which is a rectified uh, linear unit. So what it means is that you have everything with negative x is zero and then on the positive side it becomes a linear increase. Uh, and there's of course a lot of things to play around with that, but we add another dense one with 32 and then we have the last one an output of the size of our action space. And then we compile the model, uh, sticking with the uh, Adam optimizer here, and you need of course to have a loss function even when, with the reinforcement training, uh, because what you do is that you're going to tell the, the model what it should have as the quality values. We're going to get to that a little bit later. Uh, so you're going to get output from the model and it's going to tell the model this is what, I, what you should have had and it's going to use a mean square error function to try to estimate what was the error of that and then propagate that into the model to adjust the weights on, uh, on all the different connections. So now we just created one. So it's going to be randomly initialized the weights and to see a little bit about our environment, let's just see how that one does. You can see that we got a little car. This car is going to be placed randomly around the bottom here with um, speed zero. And the output that we're getting from the model is the position, x, y, and the current speed. And the, what the model can do is to push this little cart in one direction or another, and we try to get up to the the flag on the right side. That is the goal. Within 200 time steps. Each time step we get minus one score and we want as good a score as possible. If we use 200 time steps it's over. We failed. And then we do the same thing again. We just set up tensor, tensor board logging. Uh, just different log direct directory otherwise it's exactly the same. But then what do you do here? How do you train this? So just one thing before we go into the actual training is that you want to be very careful about how the rewards are designed. Uh, for one thing, it might make it harder for the model to learn. If you, for instance, have a, a continuous reward for just staying alive and you don't get an additional benefit from finishing X amount of like what your target amount is or for failing a, a, a worse reward, then it's going to learn slower because it's going to say, yeah, it's pretty good to do this as well because I got a reward. Uh, also, it's very easy to give it reward for something that is not exactly what you want to achieve because it's going to optimize exactly what you tell it to optimize, which is not exactly what you had in mind. So think that one through. Um, and then one thing that differs uh, quite a bit from the Q-learning is that you tend to separate the learning from the experiencing. 
Um, so there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, one is that experiencing might be time consuming or expensive, uh, which means that you don't want to do that as much as possible. Uh, you also, also want to take advantage of old experiences. So you save all the states that you have seen and all the actions that you have taken throughout the different games and you train on a random set from those. Um, so as I said, it reduces the, the amount of experience collection we need to do. Also, if we're training on random batch sets, it's uh, less likely that we're going to overtrain on a, on a small set. So what we want to do then is we want to play a game. We want to save the state, reward and action that we took, both the current state and the state we ended up in. And then uh, once in a while, we want to then train on a few events. And then we play again. And we do that over and over. So how, how does that look like? Let's look at the code. So first, to be able to train the model, we need to be able to give our network input and output. So how do we get an output when we just have our states? We look at the data that we had saved. So we have our, our observations from the environment, which is straight off our features. That is what we're getting in. Uh, and what we then are getting out from that, we're taking the features, we're putting that into the model, and the model then tries to, to uh, estimate the quality of the actions from that state, and we get that in an array for uh, current qualities. And then we're trying to predict the next observation, so the state that we ended up in after we took our action, and that we save that in the next one. An output is just the we have an array for what we want to get out of the, uh, the model. So how do we create that one? We go through all the data, and each of the data is exactly the same as we took this one out. It contains of the observation, the action we took, next observation, reward, and then also true false if it was the last action or not, uh, and which item it is. So we pick what the, current, what the model says is the current uh, Q values. We take the next ones, and if it was the last action, so the game ended after that, we just look at the reward that we got, and we giving that as we want the action should have this reward. So we're updating our current uh, quality uh, array, the action of those with the reward. Otherwise, we have one that looks very similar to the one we had for the Q learning. Remember, we had the reward, and then we had the gamma times the best uh, action in the next state. So we're looking at the next one, taking the best one, times gamma, and reward. The only difference here is that we don't have the, the learning rate, uh, but that is built into the actual training of the model, since there you have the optimizer, which is learning rate, and all of those. Uh, and then we append that, which means we're going to then end up with all the, the current QA with modified action, so what we want the model to put out. And then we create a data set from all the features and the output that we want. And we can then use that for training, as we see here. So we have a little function to train the model, we send in the model and the uh, gamma that we want, where we create the data set from a sample of our game memory. Uh, and then we fit our model, so we train our model on that data set in batches for one epoch. So we just do it one run through all the data. And then we have a little bit of initialization because now we're getting to the, to the actual training loop. So we have the size of memory. The more game memory that we can have, of course, we're going to be able to train on more data. But we don't want to use up our computer memory, so you should have a, a maximum amount. Um, and then we have the gamma, so how much you should be rewarded, the action should be rewarded from getting into a good state further on. Uh, then we have the decay, so how quickly our epsilon should go down, what the minimum value of our epsilon should be, and then we have starting our epsilon with one. So the first game we're going to do all random actions. Uh, and we create our memory uh, with a max size, and we start going through. And we see that this one is then 
Uh, we reset the environment. It looks very similar to the, the play loop. We just have a few more things. We have a score because now we need to sum up our reward. We don't just get a reward in the end. We get a continuous negative, negative score. Uh, and to make learning a little bit quicker, we're also keeping track of the, the best x, uh, x coordinate that we actually got. So if you remember, we tried to go to the flag on top of the hill on the right side. Uh, and the closer to it we get, the better it is. You can, of course, just use this as is and get, you get a reward, you get a better score if you reach the flag. But it takes a lot of trying before it randomly can get to that point. Uh, and we don't want to wait that long, so we're going to change the reward function a little bit and base it partially on the best acts it achieved. And then we have a T for like what is the current time step. Uh, and our game memory to save the current one. So we go through, add one to T, so we tick up one time step. We get our action out from our model with the current epsilon. Uh, and then we step the environment to get the next information, a score, uh, reward, and information if we're done or not. And then we sum up our reward that we got. And then after we're done, we then log to tensor, TensorBoard our score. What was the maximum x that we reached? So how far up that right hill did we go? Um, and then we calculate a score. As I said, we're not just looking at the main score because it's going to take us a long time. So what we're doing here is basically rewarding it a little bit for the maximum x that it's getting. Uh, and you can see here we're taking a minimum. A reason here is that it actually tried to do the wrong thing otherwise, because if you will get more than 1.5 if you're going very fast past that flag which then the model perceives as good, which is means it's going to try to get a high speed past the flag, which is not what we want. So the flag is at 0.5, so that is the maximum we, uh, we're looking at. And then we are scaling that together with the overall score. So you can see we're getting a little bit of score from the maximum x, but once we're actually getting uh, to the flag, this is going to be increasing a lot. The, uh, the actual reward or the actual score that we are that we're using, uh, and then we just go through all the memories that we had of this current game and add those with our calculated score to the main memory, so we can train on that. And that is exactly what we do afterwards. We train the model, send in the model, uh, the gamma, uh, and we then run through as you saw before the the one fitting of a random sample from the memory. Uh, then we update our epsilon, we decay it a little bit, take the max off the decayed and the minimum, minimum so we never rely too much on our uh, model, but actually try to keep exploring a little bit. So, now we run this. And we go back to TensorBoard and we see now that we have gotten a new one. We can close epsilon because we're not logging that. And I'll expand this one. So you see it going up and down, not great. We want to reach the, the plus positive plus five here, plus 0.5. So we are waiting a little bit. Let's do a refresh. We're seeing maybe it's getting up. One very good feature with TensorBoard here is if you're having this kind of, of logging, you tend to get quite noisy data. So it might be a bit hard to see if it's actually getting better or not and then you have smoothing that you can set to whatever you want to. See, it's already smoothing it out a bit. If we added a lot, you can look at just purely the trends. You can see that it's going up. So we are, we are getting better. We, uh, let's have that one, let it play for a little bit more. Because you see now it's starting to reach the minus 0.36. If we look at the score, that means that we're still getting minus 200 all the time because we're not even close to actually hitting the flag. So, but we're going somewhere and you can see that it's now jumping up a little bit. So let's just stop it anyway. We're not gonna have a great model, but why not test it out a little bit? So we go back to our little part here that we watched it play and we try it again. 
You remember last time it was just in the very, very bottom going up and down, uh, going a tiny bit back and forth. Now it's trying to push it up the hill, but it doesn't have enough power to go all the way up. Uh, standard start down in a slightly different place and it did a little bit better, but it's still doing quite poorly. So let's leave that one training for a little bit more. We start the training again and we continue and we see a little bit later how it turned out. So we're going to have a quick look at Google Cloud AI platform or a small part of it. So what we uh, do have is um, basically you get a Python environment that you are uh, can run pretty much whatever you want in. It's made for running AI stuff, of course, but you're going to see that you just get a, a, Python, a function that you can run in a Python script in. Uh, you can configure what type of machines that you want and the number of machines that you want to work with, and it also contains hyperparameter optimization that it can do for you. Uh, so hyperparameter is basically the higher level stuff, like how you build your model and what parameters you're using to train that model. So learning rate, uh, gamma, number of layers, type of layers, activation function, uh, number of nodes, like all of these things that you might want to adjust a little bit. Uh, you can tell it to try different, uh, different amounts and you're just telling it what was the score when you did this and it will try to search for the best combination of those. Uh, there are other ways, of course, to do this as well. You can, for instance, use Keras Tuner to do that uh, locally if you want to do that. Uh, but it might be nice, especially if you have a, a big model to do that, and then you can also scale out to do it many machines in parallel, and if you have a time limit on how long you want to wait. Uh, what you need to think about is that different types of machines have available in different regions. So there are different graphic cards, different, uh, like everything is definitely not available everywhere. It's quite limited on where you do different things. So think about that before you set up your project and bucket. But I will show you quickly how that, uh, how you can do that. So, if you look at the Google Cloud platform, you have jobs, you can see here, we've run bound before, we're gonna do another one. Uh, and you need, the first thing you need to do is to create a bucket. A bucket is basically a storage. So you need to be able to, uh, first of all, save the files that you have, your Python files that you want to run. And also you probably want to s store your model that you trained somewhere. So we can use uh, the Google Cloud CLI here to just create that bucket. And while it's doing that, let's have a look at what we're gonna send to it. So they have a preferred way of structuring this, which means that you have a model file uh, which contains a function to get input for your training. So this is exactly what we did in the dataset function before, where we get the, the observation features out, we get the current qualities and so on and so forth, and we ended up with a dataset. Exactly the same code, just put into a function uh, in a different file. Same thing with this one, create a model, uh, we just create the same model as before, and you can, of course, have multiple more inputs here. If you do want to do hyperparameter uh, optimization, you need to get things as number of layers and types, and you can do whatever you want in here, but you generally have a function that can give you a model back. And then you have the main file that has two parts. It has the helper function here where it gets an argument parser. So everything that you're getting from Google Cloud Platform is gonna come as a form of, of arguments. So you're saying, okay, jo job directory is where you're currently working. So this is where you want to save your, your uh, model. Uh, we have a, custom, a few custom ones here. So the game count, how many game, games we should play before we quit. Um, replay size, batch size, learning rate. You can add on whatever you feel like here. Uh, and this is exactly how you've got to get it in if, you, if you're doing hyperparameter optimization as well. And then we have the same type of get action as before. And then we create a model, create our memory, 
and we have exactly the same kind of loop as we had in our previous example. The uh, only difference is that we print out a couple of things here so we get something in the console lab form of what we were actually doing. But we are playing a game, uh, getting a score, fitting the model, exactly the same code as before. Uh, and if you run this file, what we're doing is to parse the arguments and then we are training and evaluating with those arguments. And that's it. If you look at the configuration of Google Cloud here, you can do a basic one where you just say, I want my master to be high CPU 32, so a type of machine. You can also say, I want GPUs. So I want, uh, for instance, our, my master should have an accelerator, which is one Tesla P4 graphic card. Uh, and I'm same thing with my workers uh, and then the base type of the machine. And you can configure way more things uh, if you look at documentation for Google Cloud. And then how do we run this? We have everything set up now. We have a rather long command. But what we're doing is that we're calling Google Cloud, the AI platform, we're submitting a job for training. We're giving a job name and we're appending that uh, the current time so we get a unique name. And then we have giving it where the package that it should run is, so our trainer. Our module name is trainer.task. Our main file was the task PI, as you remember. And then uh, which we can run it in, Python version, runtime version, job directory. So as you see, it's going to give a few arguments to this module and run it with this Python version. So you can basically let it do whatever you want if you want somewhere to run Python, but there might be better options than the AI platform, but it's possible. So you can, it's not locked to TensorFlow or anything like that. You can run whatever you want. Uh, you can even upload uh, private package, Python packages for it to use. Uh, and your job directory, and then you can have your own uh, arguments here. So the game count 10, we're running just 10 games. And you can see we're pointing to the configuration that we had without the GPU. Uh, in this example, we have a quite simple model and running the game is way more intensive than actually trying to fit the model, which means that we don't really gain much from having a GPU, so why not just use the simple CPU machine? So we can see it's submitted. Uh, it's gonna take a little while to, to queue it and then to prepare and download the packages that we're needing as a one before it's actually running it. So we let that sit and let's step back to TensorWord. And we see now we have gotten a bit better we have gotten higher X and we actually starting to see a little bit of scores here sometimes as well. Let's see if we reduce the smoothing here a little bit. You can see that we actually are getting to the flag once in a while. So let's try again, see if it performs any better. Going up, gathering speed and going to the flag. So we managed to get to the flag at least. Um, we did a decent score, so not too bad. Uh, we have a bit of a way to go. As you see, you, we sometimes get very bad scores and sometimes we get still 200 and don't get there. So there's still optimizations. You can have a better model. You can train it for longer. Um, there's also risk of overtraining. You can see sometimes it is getting up and then it's actually unlearning again. Uh, so there's a lot of things to play around with here. Um, and of course, might be interesting to use some kind of hyperparameter optimization either in Google Cloud or locally to see what is the best configuration for this type. Um, one thing might be that you probably shouldn't use just dense because since it's a flow, maybe it's interesting to try out, for instance, one of the ones based on series because, or so you have some kind of memory in your model, what it did before. And that was it that we had today. <laughs>